We now move on to our first panel. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Shauna Tang, who is chair of this panel. Uh, this panel is Queer Chinese Connections in Film, Television and the Media. And Dr. Shauna Tang is Senior Lecturer in Gender and Cultural Studies at Sydney University, working in the area of sexuality, gender and race. She's the author of Postcolonial Lesbian Identities in Singapore and editor of Queer Southeast Asia, both with Ratledge. Dr. Tang is currently on the editorial boards of Feminist Theory, Australian Feminist Studies, and the Journal of the Society for Asian Humanities. So thank you, Dr. Tang. Thanks, Nicholas, for that uh, introduction. Um, I want to begin with an acknowledgement. I am logging in on the land of the Gadigal people of the Iowa Nation, and I want to honour the histories of Indigenous people and acknowledge their exclusions, erasure and survival. Um, and also to recognise that this acknowledgement is a very small gesture towards the decolonization of settler colonialism and also towards the Indigenous movement for sovereignty. So welcome everyone to um, panel one titled Queer Chinese Connections in Film, Television, and Media. We have this, we have with us this evening a very um, stellar cast. Um, and um, in the interest of time, I'm going to give you a shortened version of their bios, um, but you can read their full bio and full um, fabulousness here. Okay. Um, so I'll begin with um, Andy Sia and Maggie Cheng are the creators and hosts of the Mandarin Weisu or Yuiwei WSYW podcast series, in which they have conversations with guests um, on topics on gender and identity, sexual experience, body image, queer relationship, and poly polyamory, hookup culture, public cruising, nudity, and more right? in over 70 episodes, speaking with Mandarin speakers from diverse backgrounds. Um, they will be telling us more about their fantastic podcast in their talk. Um, so I'll move on to um, Dr. Jamie Zhao, um, Assistant Professor in Media and Culture Studies in the School of Creative Media at City University of Hong Kong. Um, Jamie has published prolifically on Queer China, Queer Asia, Female Masculinity and Global TV, and is the founding co-editor of Outlash, Transdisciplinary Souths and Bloomberry's Queer China, Transnational Genders and Sexualities book series. And she co-edits that um, with Dr. Pao Hongwei, who is Associate Professor in Media Studies at the University of Nottingham, UK, and Director of the Center for Contemporary East Asian Cultural Studies. He is the author of four monographs titled Queer Comrades, Queer China, Queer Media in China and Contemporary Chinese Queer Performance. Um, finally, we have Dr. Charlie Yi Zhang, um, who is Associate Professor of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Kentucky. His monograph, Dreadful Desires, The Uses of Love in Neoliberal China, won the 2023 Annual Book Prize of Southeast Asia Southeast Conference of the Association for Asian Studies, and his publications have appeared in Gender and Sexuality Studies, Asian Studies, American Studies, as well as Media and Cultural Studies Journal. Okay. Um, so with no further ado, I'm going to um, invite um, Hongwei and Jamie to start us off on this panel, and then we'll have Charlie and finally Andy and Maggie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Shona, for your very kind introduction and thank organizers for this wonderful event, which brings so many queer researchers, activists, artists uh, together. So this is a very rare opportunity. And uh, well, so for today's very, very short talk, I'm going to talk about a type of queer transnationalism. So in today's forum, I'm aware that this is a very transnational forum where participants come from 
different parts of the world. And of course, uh, this forum is part of the Semi Pride, World Pride, which is also a transnational event. Um, uh, queer activists and queer people come from different parts of the world to celebrate diversity and so on. And my talk will focus on a particular type of transnationalism, which is a transnationalism of queer of color in the global South. Of course, when I talk about global South, I'm both referring to a type of geographical South and the kind of global South in a cultural sense. So the case studies that I'm going to look at are some queer film or queer media events participated in queer Chinese filmmakers and activists and artists together with uh, other queer of color people from other parts of the world. And most of them are situated in the late, late well, in you know, a late uh, 2010s context. And this has its particular reasons. This is all because in the 2010s, as you may know, that there was tightening of queer rights and activism in the mainland Chinese context. So a lot of queer activism became impossible. So many of them had to be on exile or have to live abroad, study abroad, and conducted their activism abroad. Of course, this is a bigger background. But this actually has enabled a type of activism where Chinese queer activists can work with activists from other parts of the world to do joint projects to create artworks and films. So the first example is Queer University, which ran between 2017 to 2019, where Chinese queer filmmakers went to Africa and collaborated with African queer filmmakers and activists. Of course, you know that both in China and in most parts of Africa, queer rights are not recognized by their nation states and so on. So this was kindly, is kind of done secretly and under the government radar. And they also organized a film festival together, such as in Beijing Queer Film Festival, which is still running, although semi-underground. So uh, African queer filmmakers are invited there to screen their films and to attend Q&As. And Chinese filmmakers also went to Ghana or Zimbabwe to showcase their films. So the picture on the right hand side shows the queer film screening event in uh, Ghana in 2018. And then uh, uh, leading to that queer film uh, festival, uh, so filmmakers worked together to produce films. And this is what is called Queer University. So one of the organizers of queer university, the Chinese uh, side uh, talked about uh, the necessity of having such events. So in China, we often looked to the West for queer activist strategies, experiences, and so on. Later, I found out that uh, good, uh, people in Africa also enjoy lower uh, uh, vis media visibility. However, most queer people in China haven't seen one African queer films, and most queer Africans haven't seen one queer Chinese films. And there are a lot of common topics to explore. And that's why they strive to bring the Chinese and African queer filmmakers together or activists to come, uh, together to make films. And of course, a lot of them are amateur, first time filmmakers, but with the kind of digital affordance and the relative affordability of digital cameras, it's possible to document their own lives, etc. And in exploring the core collaboration, uh, both sides have also expressed uh, a sense of willingness to learn and listen to each other and learn from and respect each other's culture. So the queer university program is pretty much co-constructed by both sides, involving the strategies, cultures, and uh, from both sides. So that's the first case study. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, some Chinese queer filmmakers had to be on exile and live in 
other parts of the world. A Chinese queer film filmmaker Fan Po Po was a good example. So for those who are familiar with China's queer filmmaking scene, Fan Po Po is well, he, he, uh, you know, as important as Switzerland and as prolific as Switzerland. So the fan made a lot of activist documentaries in China and after he sued the China's media censor, which is soft, so his film was basically banned in China. He couldn't do anything in China. So that was one of the reasons that he had to leave China. And he got an artist residence fellowship in Berlin and has stayed in Berlin ever since. So the second example that I'm talking about is a set of programs film programs curated by Fan Po Po, which is called Can We See Each Other? So I think this title makes it pretty clear that uh, when normally people don't see each other, especially queer people of color, they all you know, cast their gaze onto the Western white world uh, instead of looking at each other. Uh, however, there is a strong need to learn from each other and to look at each other and to work with each other to address uh, uh, shared problems. So this is a project that we aim to bring a community together to see each other and also be seen by society. There's a lack of uh, 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 events uh, bring minorities together in solidarity. So what's interesting about the film programs was that uh, uh, in curating the film, they don't curate uh, films according to national boundaries or categories. As you might know that in most Queer, I mean, most film festivals, you have Western films or kind of Asian films, African films, etc. People don't get to see what each other's films. But in this program, programming, they put, for example, Chinese films together with African films that address the same, same or similar topics to allow for this kind of transnational and cross-cultural comparison. And the final example that I'm talking about is also a filmmaking project, filmmaking podcasting project, uh, also uh, participated by Fan Po Po. Uh, he worked with other queer Asian filmmakers and artists and put together this program called Imagining Queer Bandung. So what's interesting was that they referenced as a historical event Bandung from 1955, which brought together so people from what well, African, Asia, and Caribbean contacts, and, and so on. So, but the 1955 conference was pretty much a, like government-led event. So, in which minority groups, especially issues of gender, sexuality, were in a way uh, 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 hidden or submerged within this kind of nationalist and international agenda. So, the Bandung spirit for them is still very much needed, but they have to ban uh, imagine Bandung project in a different way. So according to them, how can we imagine alternative approaches in which queer bodies across Asian, African, and Caribbean con uh, contexts participate in producing and reclaim those larger discourses for themselves, their communities, and their liberation as neither national or sexual subjects. So in other words, they're not necessarily representing each nation state, nor are they actually kind of objectified under the kind of other heterosexual gaze or the white gaze. So the film pro, uh, the program started with, of course, filmmaking workshops and podcasting workshops. And then there is a series of film screening, actually, which took place in 2021 outdoors because of the pandemic. So the event has inspired many queer people of color. For example, one of the podcasting workshop participants talks about in the past, there were only white people being their teachers. And, uh, 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 and this, uh, the Queer Bandung project is a very, you know, a supportive project for queer of colors and so on. So uh, let me, draw it to a conclusion. I've looked at different types of queer transnationalism, and this type of queer transnationalism differs from, for example, nation state led transnationalism, for example, China's whatever, Belt and Road Initiative, etc. It's participated by 
queer people who are not recognized by the nation states who are on exile most of the time who have to do things secretly or semi-secretly but at the same time they learn from each other network with each other to articulate a kind of queer of color solidarity so that's a trend that is recently ongoing and this is documented in some of my books in, in particular queer media media in China and queer China. And of course, if you have any manuscripts and you, uh, you, if you are looking for a publisher, you are also welcome to consider the Queer in China book series. Thanks very much. Thanks, Yeah, And I'd like to welcome Jamie. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, and a great job, Hong Wei, especially for a pre uh, presentation, you know, done at 5 a.m. in your time. So um, good job. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to, uh, you know, um, yeah, thank you, uh, Yan Ping, please help me share my uh, PowerPoint. Yeah, I would like to say many thanks to all the uh, colleagues who have been um, working hard to uh, put things together and make this online forum possible. And um, my great pleasure to, to, uh, to be here to present my research. Um, so for today, my presentation title is uh, Global TV Formats Queer Post-2010 China. So uh, here you can see that I use queer as a uh, verb to emphasize how certain ideas um, or, or uh, certain set of knowledge uh, um, concerning global TV formats or globalization, global media globalization can, uh, you know, carve out spaces either intentionally or uh, uh, unexpectedly uh, for gender and potentially sexually uh, non-normative expressions, performances, and intimacies. Uh, next page, please. I think it's uh, good to you know, start with a uh, brief uh, definition and uh, discussion on the uh, idea of global TV formats. Uh, so this is uh, certainly not a uh, new concept, widely discussed, has been uh, widely discussed and used in your America uh, TV studies and many, uh, many media scholars have already discussed this and related cultures in the uh, Chinese speaking world uh, since the, uh, say, late 2000s, right? So TV formats is a term uh, uh, originally defined uh, by uh, Albert uh, Moran in, in, in uh, 1998, referring to the um, uh, formalization and the regulation of the movement of program ideas flowing from one place to another, right? So at first, many television studies have uh, discussed global TVs through the uh, lens of cultural imperialism, uh, focusing primarily on uh, programs produced by US and UK markets and then exported to foreign markets. So till later in 2012, uh, along with uh, 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 the several waves of uh, TV format adaptation and innovation in different parts of the world, uh, especially within um, Asia uh, or intra-regional uh, uh, Asia, uh, global TV formats have been brought up in scholarly uh, conversations as uh, uh, this kind of uh, so-called deprovincializing approaches to media globalization. So in a, a, for example, in a special issue uh, published in 2017, I think in uh, International Journal of European, uh, uh, sorry, uh, European Cultural Studies, uh, some scholars have uh, found um, globally uh, circulated TV formats actually uh, can, can serve as effective venues, gendered venues to circulate and promote heteropatriarchal elements transnationally. Next page, please. This kind of emergence of TV formatting culture as a global phenomenon, in fact, happened in uh, started in the 1990s, the, uh, along with the rapid integration of uh, TV production, circulation, consumption, which uh, into a global a global trade system uh, at the time, which has uh, created many popular global TV formats and have become profitable media franchises and been widely made or remade in different parts of the world. So one of the most discussed um, uh, uh, cases in uh, is the uh, uh, Dutch uh, uh, reality TV franchise, The Big Brother, right? That had been adapted in uh, more than 60 region, regions uh, worldwide. And toward the end of the 2000s, a few uh, popular, uh, highly popular TV uh, formats originally developed into uh, developed uh, in Euro America, such as Idol and the Survivor. This kind of reality TV shows have 
also been widely adapted around the globe. And in addition, like something like Take Me Out is, which is a, a dating show, right? Uh, a, a dating show format originally from the UK has been adapted in China as uh, If You Are the One, Fei Cheng Wu Rao. So in one paper on Chinese um, TV format studies, Michael Keane mentioned that there have been several waves of global TV formats adaptation and innovation in China since early 2000s. The first wave is represented by the popularity of, of idol style, <clears throat> seeing competition shows adapted from the uh, Western world. The second wave is marked by the rise of parenting focused reality TV show that was originally from uh, South Korea. And nowadays in the past several years, perhaps uh, we can say uh, we have witnessed a um, the third wave or even the fourth wave of global TV format popularity in China that were um, join on both your American and Asian TV uh, cultures. Uh, so good examples include like uh, those ones showed on the slides, like the Rock and Roast adapted from Comedy uh, Central Roast from the US. Uh, and also if I am a singer uh, 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 adapted from South Korean show of the same title and the Rap of China adapted from another uh, South Korean show, Show Me the Money. Um, so there have been like plenty of studies by other scholars discussing how those adapted shows serving as effective venues to voice China's specific feminist expressions through periodic ways or to promote ethno-nationalistic sentiments through uh, you know, uh, foreigners' performances or uh, ethnic minority rap cultures. But here I would like to push further to think about and to, to ask what if the things being adapted, not just the TV formats themselves, but instead the cultural elements uh, from other places. Those of great, uh, those elements of great queer or queer ring potential. And what if those formats themselves are queer in essence, or with great power to queer the culture of the regions adapting them? So here I would like to highlight some of my um, recent publication projects that have dedicated to this um, topic. One of them is the uh, anthology uh, titled Queer TV China, just released by Hong Kong University Press by the end of February 2023. So some chapter in this book discussed how this adapted um, scene competition shows, for example, sisters who make waves or the singer, uh, those, those kind of formats allow a kind of a vocal or a persona queerness on stage. And in one of my earlier publications in 2020, in a special issue with the Journal of Continuum, I also discussed how um, the show Rap of China, this kind of male-centered rap, a mas hyper-masculine rap competition show also allows a male homosocial environment for presenting queer voices and bonding. And then in another uh, special project on queering Asian media, I co-edited with which one of our panelists today, Professor Charlie Zhang, also contributed to it. So this uh, is a is a this project will be uh, published um, in April May 2023 online with the top ranked journal GCMS. So in this project, I have a paper focused on this topic. So um, for sake of time, I just briefly discuss some relevant examples here. Um, there are some feature, uh, features of certain TV formats that contribute to enlarging the queerness of the localized shows. For instance, as early as in 2018, I have uh, you know, published a paper titled Queer Yet ne Never Lesbian about the idol style super girl scene competition. So um, Chao Jun Yu Sheng, this show. So the show format features same-sex settings, which uh, that means like only allow female uh, participants. This format allows all the uh, female participants who uh, to, to be trained, uh, live together and compete together against each other for months in that show. So in this kind of format, the, the, those, those female participants often became friends. Uh, first, and then need to battle with each other to, you know, eliminate other competitors because there can only be one winner of the show. Not to mention that the show, you know, often intentionally features some masculine tomboyish girls and couple them with traditionally feminine ones to do dual performances on stage. So, and, and in 2016, the show moved online and in fact 
added some online streaming as part of his uh, uh, um, um, uh, content. So during the, the uh, participants online uh, lives interactions and conversations with uh, uh, their audiences and fans, they also, also like intentionally acted in, intimately with each other and, and like kissing each other uh, on the face or even lips or sat on each other's laps or calling each other wifey or hobby in front of the uh, you know online uh, uh, audiences or fans. So this are uh, all in fact quite frequently used go group promotion strategies or so-called queer baiting techniques from South Korea music and celebrity industries. All right, so, and, um, in the recent popular show, um, uh, Sisters Who Make Waves, which is an idol group cultivation show featuring known aging uh, uh, celebrities, uh, started in 2020. So this queer techniques got further uh, localized and escalated in response to local needs and situations. Um, this kind of go group training shows require group members to work together and follow the lead of, of a senior powerful group leader. So this need for teamwork spirit and also um, uh, the construction of the alpha female persona uh, in the show combined together for the strength and the queer tension among the group members. Now to mention again, there were like well-known tomboyish uh, celebrity participants in the show, uh, a sister who make waves and who, who have already, those, those tomboyish celebrities have already had a lot of lesbian rumors going around and many of the uh, celebrities participating in the show, not only over 30 years old, but also single. So this kind of singledom also becomes a queer appeal of the show. And even in the heteromarital and um, familial relationships focused shows adapted from South Korea, like the parenting show that where uh, we are going, featuring a group of married male celebrities who are uh, uh, relatively young, wealthy fathers in duo with their children. So in the show that's set uh, with tasks, those male celebrities, and uh, uh, set with tasks and the challenges to overcome. So this kind of seemingly progressive gender politics enable the male celebrities to uh, learn parenting skills essential to their heterosexual uh, family lives and to uh, share the domestic labor usually shouldered by women. Yet um, they were also positioned in a male homo uh, social context in which they live together and help one another become good, caring and responsible fathers to their children. So this format, um, this kind of uh, queer subtlety of this format became particularly apparent when the third season of the show included two married uh, masculine Chinese actors, Hu Jun and Liu Ye, who uh, th these two actually once played a um, same-sex couple in the well-known well -known gay film, Lan Yu. Uh, so on the show, the celebrities were often expected to perform a revised form of Chinese hegemonic male masculinity that included acting tough and the rational when facing challenges and constructing intimate brotherhood with one another as well as you know being considerate and gentle to their family members so through all of those the show's ultimate appeal becomes is queer reworking of the gendered and sexual dimension of the celebrity participants lives and experiences on tv on TV. Uh, lastly, I want to briefly uh, mention uh, another show here, the Use With You 2 Go Group Manufacturing show streamed online in the first half of 2020. Different from Sisters Who Make Waves, this show features young grassroots or less well-known trainees who want to uh, become um, Go Group source. The show was adapted from South Korean show format and produced and aired during the most severe time of COVID search in China in the uh, 2020. Meanwhile, this uh, production was closely following the revival of hyperfeminine girl, uh, girl pop cultures in China in the late 2010s, when, uh, um, which was shaped by the recent um, uh, official family planning policies targeting uh, women and the rise of uh, neo-Confucian uh, ideas in mainstream uh, Chinese society and the growing influences of East Asian uh, kawaii cultures. So the eventual uh, winner of the show, uh, who also won the central position of the debuted girl band was a tomboyish girl. So the show's format, first of all, 
um, <clears throat> allows a uh, queer natured mentorship involving several gender non-normative celebrities to serve as mentor and coach on the show to train the girl group, such as the ethnic Thai K-pop idol Lisa, the used to be tomboyish uh, Taiwanese singer Ella, and the androgynous effeminate uh, male idol Tsai Xu Kun. So all, uh, not only like gender non-normative, but also uh, successfully commercialize their own queer personas and fan bases in the industries. So this mentorship uh, transformed androgyny as a unique appeal and marketable diversity of the girl group stars instead of something you know deviant, right? Moreover, the show intentionally interweaves the gender non-normative elements with Chinese specific discourses on family thoughts and go power as well as Chinese uh, nationalistic and neoliberal uh, self-cultivation kind of mentalities. So this successfully uh, put the supposedly queer, queer uh, dimension or queerness of the show back to an uh, officially sanctioned uh, feminist discourse while fetishizing and commercializing all those um, uh, non-normative women persona sentiments and performances spans um, uh, through the last two uh, decades. So in this sense, the global TV formats, I would argue, converged with Asian uh, gender, feminist, and queer cultures and negotiated itself with modern uh, Chinese and contemporary Chinese feminist histories and traditions and values and the women's situations to uh, together to present a queer uh, women-centered, highly commercialized spectacle in the most difficult time of a uh, pandemic era China. So um, last slide, please. <clears throat> so that's uh, actually all I got for today. Uh, thank you for your attention and support. Thanks, Jamie, for that presentation. Also on a different time zone, I believe. Yeah. And uh, I'd like now to welcome um, Charlie, um, who's logging in from elsewhere as well. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to join this fantastic panel. And uh, just like what uh, Hongwei and Jamie mentioned, it's really my honor to share my work with the colleagues uh, in Australia. And the topic for my talk today is called Making Home from Afar Through the Gendered and Sexualized Linkages. Um, in August 2022, uh, the Tourism Authority of Thailand featured two popular boys' love, or BL, drama actors who are known as Bill King and the PP to facilitate its tourism promotion campaign because Thai BL now occupies a prominent position in the trans-Asian popular cultural industry. In 2022 alone, over uh, 120 BL TV dramas were shown on a, a variety of platforms across Asia, and at least one third of them were made in Thailand. As I argued elsewhere, Thai, Thai BL has built a solid uh, fan base uh, by integrating the hyper-romanticized queerness popularized by Japanese BL and the androgynous masculinity characterizing K-pop culture into its unique social cultural milieu as a rainbow mecca in the world. Uh, as I will show in this presentation, the banging of TV dramas based upon adaptation of BL stories in China created another opportunity for the development of the Thai BL industry by centering on Chinese diasporic uh, communities and foregrounding the fragile scholarly style of manhood central to the Confucian tradition, the Thai BL genre has acquired new features with Chinese characteristics that attract an enormous number of Chinese fans. So here are some of the examples that I just mentioned earlier, the in integrative uh, strategy of combining the Japanese BL with the aesthetic standard of K-pop. So here's the uh, BL King and the, uh, PP. This is a very famous uh, very popular uh, BL celebrity couple. And this is uh, New and the Dawan, uh, another popular uh, BL celebrity couple. And the last one, so that's uh, Om and Fluke. So my presentation today will focus on two shows. I told something about you, which was first released by uh, Line TV in uh, late 2020. And the second is called To Serve With Love that was released by GMM1 
in late 2022. Uh, for context, uh, Thailand has the largest uh, Chinese diaspora in the world, but uh, Thailand also occupied a very unique position, especially during the Cold War. And the United States utilized Thailand as a bastion to push back the communist influence, especially from the side, uh, from the Soviet supported uh, Vietnam. Um, and uh, the Thai government has been practicing the policy of uh, cultural assimilation. As a result, uh, compared with other countries in Southeast Asia, uh, Chinese diasporas living in Thailand, they don't have um, much opportunity to, or as much opportunity uh, to uh, learn and speak uh, Chinese language. And they also don't uh, keep as much uh, their cultural tradition. For example, they uh, drop their Chinese names and they adopt the very long Thai family name. Um, so, um, the first uh, show, uh, I Told Something About You, was uh, mainly set in the background of uh, Phuket Old Town, where there is a huge Chinese immigrant uh, population, especially from the southern part of China. Of southern part of China, and um, so this show actually utilizes the BL informed queerness as the popularize the platform to uh, help the, um, the audiences to learn more about the Chinese immigrant community. Um, as you can see from this picture, so in Phuket, uh, the old town, the dominant architectural style is, uh, is called a veranda. Uh, veranda. Um, it, it is um, the first floor of this um, building is utilized for the commercial purpose, while the second floor is for living. So throughout the show, there are a number of uh, uh, cultural heritages or historical sites with the long history of Chinese immigration uh, show uh, uh, featured and uh, uh, highlighted. Um, so this is one of the example about the the, the architectural style I was mentioning. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, earlier. So this is the home of one of the protagonists uh, whose name is De. And it's actually the, uh, the the Hokkien pronunciation of tea, Chinese tea. So the first floor is the the the, the restaurant which was run by Des' mother that sells many Chinese food, especially Hokkien style food. And the second floor is the home where De and his mother and his brother live. So this is another picture, another thing from the show, uh, um, showing that uh, De is standing in front of his home, in front of the restaurant. So um, there are a number of, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, Hokkien uh, food is featured in this show, uh, throughout this show. This is a scene that shows um, Dad on the right side and uh, his uh, friend or his boyfriend on the left side, whose name is uh, O.L., uh, performed by P.P. So they are having a uh, Hokkien noodle together, which is kind of cute. And um, another example about the, the site with a long history of uh, immigration is called the Soy Romani. So this used to be the red light district where there were a lot of uh, brothels providing service for the Chinese immigrant workers who were attracted for the job opportunities uh, in the teen mining industry in the region. So in this, uh, uh, in this, Alley, a, a number of uh, um, scenes of the romantic encounters between Day and the OL were made here. And uh, it also turned into a very popular touristy destination for a lot of uh, visitors from around the world after the success of this show. And another example about the historical site is the Taoist temple named uh, Ding Guang Tang. And uh, you can see they and uh, uh, OL, they were making wishes in, in front of the temple before they uh, took the national entrance exam for the uh, uh, college. Um, so this is another historical site. And uh, this uh, thing is about a day is having a date with his ex-girlfriend. And behind them, there's a wall. And behind the wall, there's a place which now turns into the Phuket Taihua uh, Museum, Pujidao, Taihua Guan. But this place used to be a school that provide education. That is the only school that provide education in the Chinese language for the local immigrant communities. So this is another thing about uh, uh, OL and the dad, they were taking the courses about Chinese language in the tutoring school. 
and also the film, the the the, sh the show features uh, the music with the Chinese characteristics, and the the theme song has. There are two versions of the theme song. The the high version is called Skyline, uh, performed by uh, Bill King, and the Chinese version called Ruhe, performed by uh, PP. And both of them uh, become uh, very very popular, especially in Chinese market. So um, just like the first example, the second example, two thirds with love all also has another name it's called kun chai which means uh, a song of a rich or elite family uh, this show also utilize the queer the bio informed queerness as a platform to uh, explore and to for people to learn more about the long history of chinese immigration immigrants in thailand so this show uh, 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 is about the uh, air issue of uh, a commercial consortium of Chinese immigrants, which is called uh, Five Dragon Guild or Wu Long Hui. And uh, according to the rule, only the um, the, the, the the man who can demonstrate and who can embody the heteropatriarchal ideal and who can demonstrate the hypermasculinity will be the leader of the group. Uh, so the presumed leader, Mr. Zhang, on the left side of this picture. Uh, turned out to be a gay. So in that regard, he lost his uh, his uh, opportunity to become the next uh, uh, next leader of the groups. That's why Mr. Song, who is the current leader of the group, was very sad and was crying over the dead body of his uh, his friend. Um, so this is the family of Mr. Song, who is also the dominant group, a uh, dominant one in this business consortium. But very uh, ironically, his uh, eldest, son, eldest son, who will be the next leader, also turned out to be uh, gay. And so the whole story develops around the issue that also promotes uh, multiple things of fights within the family over the, the, the title of who can be the next heir. And uh, again, this show provides the opportunities for the audience to learn a number of uh, uh, things about the Chinese uh, the, the cultural heritages with Chinese uh, ca uh, characteristics. For example, the dressing style. So this is the song, eldest song of the, the, uh, Mr. Song, whose name is Tian. And um, so this is his uh, lover who is a poor worker and the uh, dressing style. Chinese style. This is the another example about the dressing style, which is featured in this show, um, and uh, another example about the dressing style, and uh, this is the example about the cultural rituals, another example about the cultural rituals, and uh, of course the music. So just like the uh, I told something about you, there are two versions of the 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 theme song of the show. Uh, both of them are performed by uh, Nunio, uh, which who is showing this picture, and who is actually uh, a college student who majored in Chinese language. Uh, language. So the Chinese version especially uh, received a lot of uh, praises for the pronunciation of Nunio. Uh, that almost there's almost he doesn't have any accent which is very accurate and many many chinese fans especially promoted and love this version um so um, the second part is what i call the fragile and scholarly masculinity as a bridge with the homeland so for the Thai bio uh, culture industry and uh, almost all of the male actors, they needed to have a muscular and well chiseled body. As many uh, fans joke about it, they, they, this is what they say. So six packs are the defining feature or the bottom line of the BL actors. So you have to have a very muscular body and you have to um, show that throughout the show and as a major attraction for the audience as well. So this is another example. Uh, also, you needed to demonstrate outstanding talents for sports or outstanding talents for music or you have to major in those uh, in those fields such as engineer uh, or medical science that will uh, also boast uh, boost your masculinity but very interesting uh, very, it's very interesting to see that in i talked something about you uh, both of the uh, protagonists they don't have this kind of body actually um on the left side uh, dead and he's a little bit chubby with a baby face and the OL or PP, and he's super skinny. Um, and uh, also, um, both 
uh, uh, both protagonists, they like to cry. They were never hesitant to show their expressions in the public. And they constantly cry to each other throughout the show. And this is another thing about dead crying. And this is another uh, example. And this is another example. So many fans, they talk about the most memorable uh, feature of this show is that the, it, the constant show uh, the things about they crying in the public. And just like uh, I told Sansa about you. So in the second example, so Tian likes to cry as well. And also he's very good about scholarly performance, but he's not good about like martial arts. And so he constantly cry and show his emotions throughout the, the show. So this is um, some of, th these are some of the examples. So here is my conclusion. So the gender and sexualized linkage offers a new lens to revisit what it means to be Chinese or Chinese diasporas or, and China while the social cultural dynamics in Southeast Asia is reshaped by the PRC's geopolitical initiative to increase its presence in the region. So thank you for your attention. And uh, here's, uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, thanks so much for that, Charlie. I'd now like to invite um, Andy and Meki to present on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tom, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maki, and with me today is my podcast partner, Andy. Um, thanks again for the warm introduction earlier, Dr. Tom. We're very flattered to be here, along with a stellar list of academics. In fact, you might have noticed that Andy and I are the only two person in the room today who neither have a professor prefix, nor do we have a PhD. And although we'll be speaking English throughout today, Wei Suo Yue is in fact a Mandarin podcast show. Andy and I rarely talk English on the show. So this is actually a slightly awkward format for both of us. So you might ask two non-academic people who don't really speak English for their work crashing at an English academic forum, what are we doing here? Um, let us remind you that this forum is about queer Chinese voices. So we think we might be pretty relevant here. We'll let you be the judge of that after this presentation. Um, last point, uh, we also have a QR code going on on the top right hand side of the corner. If any, at any given point, we have piqued your interest, give it a scan using your phone and you can find us right there. Okay, that's enough mumbo from me. Andy, are you ready? Let's get started. Okay. Okay, so welcome to Weisou Yue. I am Andy. I'm Maki. Andy. Maki. Yeah, this is how we start our episodes every time. Yes. Um, so let me please let me introduce our um, two podcast superstars, me and Maki. Um, definitely not the cats in the picture. Um, sometimes I really hope those cats can help us with, with some works. But unfortunately, they are just being cats at this stage. Um, so me and Maki are both Australian gay men. Uh, we are originally from mainland China. We have been in Australia for over 10 years and 14 years for me and 12 years for Maki. Um, so as we're Australian now, sometimes we know where we share Australian values, even sometimes. I don't know what Australian value is, but we do. Um, we, we both work nine to five in Melbourne. So the podcast is a side project and our big hobby. Um, so we want to play three clips of our show just to give you a bit of a taste. And warning, we didn't really translate every bit of the content. So apologize. But let's start with a clip on an episode talking about HIV. 这样我就就越要证明给你看，然后当有HIV那一天，我是觉得这场战役那是彻底输了呀。在悉尼被被诊断，那他们给予的这种是一种很全面的healthcare，并不是说给你开瓶让你自己回家吃就完了，他是会问
他们在干嘛呢？对，至此我才知道，他们的这个 workshop 其实是给一些对 s o n a 比较感兴趣，但是没有勇气进来的一些给。做一个这样的讲座，这听起来很不妙、啊。<笑>对，这非常非常的不妙。<笑> and finally, uh, uh, is a clip from our conversation with a mother who has a gay son and is now actually an activist for our community. 刚知道有这么一回事，原来还有男的喜欢男的，女的喜欢女的，真是奇怪哦。就这种感觉，正好去跟着新东方去了一趟美国，大概半半个月吧。我说我我对你的要求特别低，你就是身体健康、心理健康，不是同性恋<笑>就行。我感觉他现在有点开放，就是你们叫什么<笑>什么约炮是吧？嗯嗯，直接跟我说了吗？这样的，其实对这种事儿，我是一直嗯不接受的。嗯，像我。Oh, um, that's the clip. I'll hand over to Andy. Okay, so who are we? So, we, so we, like you have heard, we have had a lot of conversation between us and the guests. So, we so you is a conversational podcast. That amplify the voice of Mandarin speakers in the LGBTQIA community. It creates a space for a safe space for meaningful and respectful and uncensored like dialogue. So they will, like Maki said, will they will be conducted entirely in Chinese. So we are allowing more Chinese people, LGBTQ people, to hear、um, their own voice, understand their own rights, and also raise awareness and some attention to some our community issues. So we've mentioned these four words a lot. Wei Suo Yu Wei. If you don't speak Mandarin, what it actually means is do what you desire.、Um, so why why do we start this、um, podcast, Andy? Well, I've done that for two and a half years, and now it sounds like a long story. <laughs>、uh, so、um, previously, I have experience with doing a LGBTQ podcast in China. That was about three years.、Uh, unfortunately, the whole podcast was taken down and deleted by the platform. That's the Chinese platform,、um, due, due to the Chinese censorship. I don't even have a local records for all of those episodes, so it's a, become a permanent loss for myself. I feel really, really sad about it. And during COVID time, my good friend Maki and a very talented designer,、um, so he encouraged me to start again and make a better one. So we start again and we have brainstorm.、Uh, we, we we just start again like immediately. We 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 have we brainstorm a lot of interesting topics together, and we found a group of interesting people in Melbourne or other cities to test discussion with us. So、um, I, we believe it's a it's a perfect format. Work it, it works for us perfectly because we we still have our work life balance and we have the voice for LGBTQI community. So in summary, it's really just me and Andy, two friends. We love having conversations, but at the same times,、um, I think as Andy has highlighted, we really want to have a place that we can just speak freely in our own language, but also without the censorship from Chinese government. Um, so I'll just briefly take you through on our journey so far.、Um, it has been 2.5 years.、Um, we've produced around 70 hours content with 73 episodes,、um, covered、uh, 45 different guests with a very vast background,、um, and we are very happy to announce that we've actually covered maybe 94 countries and regions. Although some of them might be actually from the VPN that、uh, the VPN address that people have been using. Um, and these are the different sort of people that we've been chatting to,、um, and we know it's a broad, broad spectrum. And we'd love to talk to more people,、um, and we'll continue to do so. And let let Andy talk about what sort of、um, topics we've been、um, chatting on our podcast. Well,、um, well, it's due to the limitation, we cannot list all the topics here, but we. Um, we, and we for the last two and a half years, we have talked about these stories like gay sauna, BDSM, hookups,、um, and OG. Sometimes a new party like naughty stories. In terms of relationships, we have also discussed about open relationship and polyamory.、Uh, of course, we have guests、um, to practice those as well.、Um, we also have educational episodes such as HIV, like you have heard some、uh, one clip before,、um, and STI. Um, mental therapy. Of course, we have quite a few coming out stories, which、um, provide a reference for Mandarin speaking audience.、Uh, next slide, please, Maki.、Uh, okay, so we apart from those, we have the topics for the more serious topics. We have, for for example, the oral history for the seniors,、um, homosexual, and the fetish and gender masculinity. 
body image and gay travel. So gay travel is we have shared so many gay um, travel traveling stories from like in Vietnam, in Thailand, Japan, and in the future we'll go to so many other different places. We will we are excited to share those stories to other people. Uh, apart from those top topics, we also have some episodes just for me and Maki to catch up. For example, we have watched some movies or have some play some games. Um, we just use those catch-up episodes to tell people what have done recently. Um, we have learned from our we, we we are inspired by our guests or by some books, and we practice and learn from them. Uh, so we'd really love to. It's two point five years. We want to share a little bit of thoughts from both of us. Um, so here, starting with some collective thoughts, I guess. First up, um, I think this was in our recent chat with an NGO called Entra in Sydney. I think they're here today. Uh, they talk about how in the 2017 same-sex marriage survey, how a senator talked about there's often silence from Chinese community. So stepping on the shoulders of all the people and activists uh, come before us, we also want to join that voice and be that voice quite literally. Um, and uh, I don't think it will be surprising that actually um, the queer community in mainland China is also very interested in, in this voice. In fact, 50% of our listener were using our website to listen to individual episodes every time we release one because there was no other ways for our words to be streamed on major platforms, big or small. Unfortunately, our website was blacklisted since October last year, and we're still trying to figure out a way to reach back to our audiences. And finally, the last point is never, and I mean, I really mean never, overlook the power of speaking in our own language, being able to talk about sex, desire, body, gender, and all the other taboo topics using our own language uh, in a Western society is both powerful and empowering for the people who speaks it and who listen to it. So back to you, Andy, I'm really interested in what have you felt or learned through creating our podcast? Um, so during the last two and a half years, so we, of course, we have met so many new friends because of the podcast. Um, so those people have inspired me and make me a better self i'm not i'm it's, it's real it's real i have gained i've gained new perspectives about the world around me um i even i even came out successfully to my parents last month um i think it's partly due because of this uh, podcast um of course the, the, the podcast did not push me to do it but i was inspired by so many other people's stories and i believe that i will be okay and i can handle it i i am not alone so yes i'm I'm become more happy to continue share our thoughts and discussion and ideas with audience along the way. Uh, what about you, Maki? So for myself, I guess the past 2.5 years that I've been making this podcast with Andy together is the five point, uh, 2.5 years that I've spent to liberate myself, I guess, from not willing to really understand my body, my desire, desire and my emotion to fully embrace who I am and just be okay with it and talk about it on the podcast. And like Andy said, we met so many interesting people from tops to bottoms, from sex toy shop owner to a mother of a gay son, from amateur porn star to HIV activist, from reporter to street artists. What's even more amazing is as an immigrant, I started to finding my roots in Melbourne, I guess, and in the local queer community. And I'm sure that that's a really tough gig for anyone that shares similar migrating experience with me and Andy. Um, selfishly, the podcast has made a lot of impact on my life as well, um, similar to Andy's story, but in a different spin. I'll give you an example. So it turns out uh, in the third clip, the mom who was talking, she lives quite close to my mom in my home city in China. Earlier last year, she invited my mom over for dinner with her son. Um, and with her help, uh, my mom finally come out of the closet. I actually pushed her into when I came out to my family back in 2019. So this has really been more than just a podcast for both of us. I guess it's truly a witness and an active contributor to our life. Uh, and more than once, we've heard our audience are on this journey with us together. So we think we're on to something here. Uh, which brings us to what's coming next for our podcast um, it might sound quite long, 2.5 years, or maybe not for all of the academics that's working really hard, but we really feel like we've only scratched the surfaces. We want, we want to engage with more activists and NGOs for queers. We love to get to know um, challenges facing by the intersex people, asexual, two of the many more minority groups that we haven't had a chance to chat to yet. Of course, we're going, going to continue talking about sex because we know our audience really love that part of our show. 
and many more shapes of relationship like thropo or more different dynamic form of polyamory. So if you know someone who has an incredible story to share or it's something queer you are passionate about, we'd love to talk to you and get your voice heard. And Andy will tell you how to get to us. Yes, so how to find Ways or you were eight, so you can always you can find our show in uh, most of the mainstream um, podcast platforms such as Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and if you don't use any of those, you can always um, log into our uh, website to listen to our show directly. Um, but if you live in mainland China, uh, you probably need to use VPN to listen to it. Um, how to interact with us? We have a Telegram group you, which you can share everything, basically everything in in there. Um, I, I'm actually surprised how, how much they have shared in the group. Um, so we do have our Instagram as well. Um, so we use the Instagram to pr promote our episodes. Uh, of course, you can talk to us directly. Um, in China, in mainland China, we have a, um, a group in Douban, which we have more than a thousand people in there. Um, but if you don't like any of those, you can uh, feel free to just send us an email anytime to share your stories, any your thoughts, and we will try to reply to you like within 48 hours. <laughs> and to wrap up everything, we really love your support for our podcast um, by simply leave reviews or comments on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Of course, we love your donation. Um, this isn't a non-for-profit thing for us as well. We love something to keep us striving forward. Um, and if anything, um, if you love our podcast or if you piqued your interest today, feel free to share this with others. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoy our little segment and hopefully you'll walk away. Remember, there is a podcast right now. It's in blue color. It's in Mandarin for the Chinese queer community in Australia and beyond. And again, it's not too late to scan that QR code on the top right. That's us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks um, Andy and Maggie and the other panelists, um, Jamie, Hongwei and Charlie for the incredible work that you do. Uh, fortunately, we won't have time for Q&A, so we'll just move on and I'll pass, um, I'll pass it over to Nick or Jinghan. <laughs>